Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Bernatos, and I am the Director of Instrumental School Methods and Repertoire for Alfred Music. And I'm very excited to be here once again with one of our incredible clinicians, Dr. David Pope, who is joining us for Five Questions with David Pope. Dr. Pope is an Associate Professor of Music Education and Chair of the Professional Studies Department at the Baldwin University Conservatory of Music. In addition, he serves as an educational clinician for us, Alfred Music, and as the American String Teachers Association's National Conference Chair. David, thanks for joining us today for your five questions. Thanks for having me, Chris. I look forward to it. Well, you say that now. You haven't heard the questions, so keep that optimism going. <laughs> Actually, we'll start nice and easy. We're going to get right into it. The first question is, who was your most influential music teacher and why? This is a hard question for me. I've had really, I've had two really influential music teachers in my life. Um, my first one was my was my school teacher um, when I was growing up. His name was Bill Robinson. I actually had, uh, and I still call him Mr. Robinson to this day. I worked with him. My first job was the school system I worked, I taught, I went to, and I still couldn't call him by his first name. I guess that just sticks with you. But it I was, I had, I, yeah, I had him for fourth grade through twelfth grade. And I remember distinctly, it's a small school system. I remember distinctly going to Allstate my sophomore year of high school and him turning off the radio when we left, before we left the school parking lot. And then actually we talked for the next four hours driving to Nashville for Allstate. And that's when he figured out that I wanted to be a teacher and kind of led me down that path and gave me opportunities. The other person that I really, that I really owe a lot to is Michael Allen, who is my professor at Florida State. Um, again, classes and methods and everything else I learned with him were wonderful. But what I loved about him is the fact that we would, we would he took me under his wing. And he would, we would sit in his office for hours and just talk. It wasn't the lessons I learned in class. It was sitting in his office and all those conversations we have with colleagues that I would have on a daily basis with him. Um, and it's like going to conferences, all, all, all those conversations outside of the sessions. That's where that's where he really influenced me and kind of pointed me in the right direction and took me under his wing and, and really helped me out. And that's awesome. And these questions usually come back to the same kind of concept. It's usually the relationship that's as influential as their artistry or their pedagogy or whatever it is. But it's it's just that connection that you made. And I was going to tell you, it's okay to say more than one. It's really hard to narrow that down. But that was, that's fantastic. Well, 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 Chris, I was only allowed to give one. I would say, Chris, that it's you. You're the most <laughs> influential person in my life. That's only because I'm driving the ship here. That's okay. I, I actually agree with you on relationships. That's something, as somebody who teaches future music educators, I, I, I really emphasize that more than the content. If There's a great quote by um, Rita Pearson who did a, a TED Talk that says, students don't learn from people they don't like. And that's something that's always in the back of my mind, isn't it, if somebody who's teaching future teachers and, and, and I had those great relationships with my, with, my, with my professors and my former teachers. And so that's something I want to pass along to my students. Oh, that is, that's fantastic. And I couldn't agree with that more. And that is the, a very delicate balance between, you know, that personal relationship with students. And, you know, it's like, it's like parenting in a sense, like I'm not your friend, I'm still your parent, but I still care about you. It's a, it's a great conversation to, that we'll have at the next conference when we see each other. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go on to number two which is a little bit related. Maybe you can pull from this historical perspective. Do you have a favorite memory from or of a specific performance? I'm gonna connect this to two because I think they're related for me. Uh, one is back as a senior in high school, I remember playing in Allstate. I don't know why that just pops in my head. I remember playing all of Pines of Rome. I love Pines of Rome. I had never heard the piece before and we were doing that. And I think that I think the conductor was was, Colonel Arnold Gabriel, the one we've all had at some point in our life. And I remember I remember playing through that, two, a couple of memories from that. One, I remember there was, I think it's the beginning of the third movement or something. There's a really soft spot where there's something quiet is going on. I remember a friend of mine dropping their, um, she's a horn player, dropping her mute. And we were playing at an auditorium in Nashville and the mute rolling down the stage. You can hear it rolling on the recording. Before it falls off the stage, you hear it bounce. So. <laughs> That one sticks out. But again, the fourth movement of that, when you have the antiphonal brass and playing that as a cellist and the cello part is boring. It is, it is, it's, it's like you play quarter notes just the whole time. You may get, it's like, it's like our other version of Pachelbel, uh, <laughs> of, of the Pachelbel's canon. Uh, so I remember doing that, that made me love that piece. And it came full circle for me probably three, four, five years ago when I got to conduct that at a summer music camp and got to have antiphonal brass and, and that, that, that's on the bucket list for me. And that was, that's one of those really memories I, I, that stick out. 
because I because I got to come full circle and share my love for that piece with future students. Uh, Dream, just do you know, I, I want to play timpani on the opening of Shostakovich Five. Um, and the other one is is 1812 with real cannons. So th that's the dream. Those two, those two are left. I can get behind all of those. Those are all awesome. And when you conducted it, did you instruct the French horns to drop their mutes at that moment? I did not, but I should have. <laughs> um, I I remember actually working at. I was a I, I, again. This is I'm a big geek. I was an orchestra librarian for the Aspen Music Festival in Spoleto in, in Charleston. And I remember meeting the assistant conductor in Charleston for one of our finale concerts. His job was to conduct the fireworks for 1812 Overture. I was like, how do you, where did I go wrong in life? How do I get the job of going shoot the fireworks and get paid for this? So again, uh, yeah, all of them kind of connect, but definitely Pines of Rome is, is the one I always go back to. That's great. And I like that it's a, a funny story, but also like a connection with the music and, and the emotional aspect of that too. That's awesome. All right, on to number three. So you're currently teaching methods classes. Uh, what is something that's different about kids today versus when you or I might have been in their shoes? Well, first off, I, I don't think you and I were kids at the same time. Um, I actually used electricity when I was growing up. So, uh, no, Chris, I, you know I love you. Uh, now, I think kids today, compared to when, when I, we were growing up, because we're similar age, is back when we were growing up, I think when our professors told us to do something, we didn't question it. We just did it. If our high school band director or teacher told us to, we just like, okay, that's the job, go do it. And I don't, I, I think that's good and bad. I think my students today, they, 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 they're a lot more thoughtful than I was at the age of 17, 18, or even, I'll even go 30. <laughs> um, they, they're a lot more thoughtful. They, they think about, they think about the then what, then what, then what. They think, how can we get everyone involved? They think about how it's going to go, how it's, how everybody's going to react to a situation. They question me in a good way and actually makes me think differently. And so I think that's a good thing. Um, it's some, sometimes, I mean, it, it's a, it, they're, they're a little more, they ask a few more questions than I wish they would, <laughs> but I'm just, I wish they would just trust a little bit more, but they're really thoughtful and they, they try to get beyond just the surface of a topic or whatever we're trying to learn. And I think that's a really good thing. Yeah, that's interesting because there, there is push and pull with that. It's again, like, you know, the questioning does make you reflect and makes you maybe even change your own thing. And that's the big secret of being a teacher is that we actually continue to learn. We're not just the teacher. That's that, you know, that cliche that we learn from our students, but it's really truthful. So I think it, that is a good change, but also having that, you, they've got to trust you. Like, yes, experience matters, but that is a, a, a nice balance. And it's a good, a good thing to be a look at what we do and how we do it. Well, I think it goes back to what we talked about initially, relationships. Um, one of the things I miss most about teaching college, and I'm sure this is something that you may miss in your current position from your former um, the days days teaching um, K through 12 school, is is that relationship you have with your students, and, I, and 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 when they come into your classroom, your music classroom before school and hang out, or they go in your your come in after school, and you have to kick them out at six or seven o'clock because you want to go home. I mean, I used to do things with my students, um, and when I taught high school first thing in the morning, is we we had a, we had a, a commercial grade Keurig coffee maker in my office, and the kids would come in and get coffee and hang out. What every two weeks on Fridays, we did a pancake Friday where I would have bring it a griddle and make pancakes under the radar and not let my school administration in. <laughs> that's that's the, the kind of culture I want to have with my students now is. I want them to know they can come in my office or come before or after classes early or as late as they want and, and hang out. Because again, it goes back to those conversations that don't happen in class, those relationships, so they trust you. Um, and that, that's, that's what's something I really concentrate on my students is, is, is building that relationship and getting them just, hey, trust me outside of class and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. That's great. That's, that rapport is, is something that is just incredibly important. Actually, it was important when we were younger. I'll let you know when I turn 30, if I mature at all. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that I valued when I was younger also. All right, let's go on to this next question. I'm very curious about this answer because it can go several different ways. If you didn't play cello, what instrument would you have chosen and why? What instrument do you play, Chris? Trumpet is my primary. Trumpet's your primary? Okay, so not trumpet. I'll narrow that one out right now. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've been told, I'm not sure if this is a good or bad thing, I have the personality of a trombone player. Um, Chris, can, can you help me out there? <laughs> I could see that. I could see it. You're um, intelligent. You're good looking. You got a great sense of humor to all my trombone friends out there. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, for me, I guess going through methods courses as, as, a, as an undergrad of music ed, 
Uh, first off, it took me two weeks to learn how to buzz on a French horn mouthpiece. I remember driving from Tallahassee, Florida to Gulf Shores, Alabama with a mouthpiece in my, in trying to learn how to buzz. So French horn is out. Um, oboe and bassoon are out because again, you have to like make your own stuff. And I had to make on, I, my, when I took bassoon at our double read techniques classes in undergrad, we had to play on reeds we made. It was wow. terrible. Uh, and our final for bassoon, it was. Our, our final for bassoon was, a, was an excerpt from Sorcerer's Apprentice. You, oh. you know the one. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. There was lots of tears. Um, and then the oboe was Peter and the Wolf. That was wow. our final. I remember, this is back in VHS days. I taped these a measure at a time. You saw me play a measure, get up in front of the camera, turn the camera off, come back, play the next measure, do that. That's the, oh, I'm, yeah, so no, those two are out. Um, if I was had to choose, I don't know, maybe viola, and this is a long way to get to, but maybe viola, because again, I've, I've, I think in my life, violist, violist are, I think violists are really awesome. They kind of march to the beat of their own drummer. I think, I think they use that to their advantage at times. They're like, I'm a violist. I, that's why I did that. I, I think I could really live that up and live the good life, just kind of going, I'm a violist. That's why I can get away with this. Um, yeah, that and I think that, yeah. So, and being a cellist, I, I'm not a fan of the E string of violin. I'll be very honest, especially like fifth, sixth, seventh position. It's too high for me. It's a little bit of cello, but with a little bit more freedom. Wow, that's great. That's really interesting. I, I would pick, I actually was wondering if you were going to pick viola uh, for a few reasons. Uh, but I know for me, it would be French horn, interestingly, because of like, it's the passion of those lines that French horn can get in all kinds of music. It changes character. I find that correlation with the viola parts as well in a lot of music. Also with cello. So there's a lot of correlation there. I actually wanted to be a double bass player when I started. I started an orchestra in fourth grade, again with Mr. Robinson. Um, I started fourth grade and they wouldn't let anyone start on double bass. And I knew I didn't want to play violin because that's all what all my friends chose. Yeah. And so then I said viola and he actually talked me out of it. <laughs> so, and then I played, then I stuck with cello and my first cello teacher, her name was Phyllis Steen. And she actually played with Elvis back in the day. Wow. Uh, so she had really good stories and I, and I really appreciate her and, and, and things like that. That's great. All right, we're at our fifth and final question. Wait, we we're almost done? It's so sad. Well, I mean, we can, we can talk after this, it's fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, number five, I, know, I do know that you love to play golf and I'm curious and maybe others would be too. How did you get started golfing and where have been some of your favorite courses to play? Okay, so for, first off, let me state this right away. I love being a music teacher. I, it's what I love doing, however, if I could work for the PGA Tour and travel around with them week to week, I would give up this whole music thing. <laughs> again, again, we all have that one job. Again, maybe it's like shooting the fireworks. That's the computing fireworks. But working for the PGA Tour would be the one thing I would probably, I would have to think long and hard about doing, about what I did for a living. Um, I started golf in high school. I was, a, I was played sports growing up, football, baseball, all those things. And I was working on a project with a friend and of course, being high school boys, we skipped out doing what we were actually supposed to do and went to the golf course. And he's like, do you want to play golf? I'm like, I've never done it. So we went to the golf course and he kind of got me addicted on golf. It's like, just try it. And we, and then it was just snowballed from there. Um, and then I was really terrible for a long time. I still think I'm terrible, but <laughs> uh, a long time. And so, and then um, as for favorite courses, I mean, TPC Sawgrass is a favorite. It's the one with the Island Green. I've probably played that five or six times. Oh, I'm wow. happy to report I am under par. I'm number 17 with the Island Green. I think I have like one birdie and five pars. Wow. Uh, I, I rub that into my brother who's like hit so many balls in the water. He needs to become a scuba diver. Um, this, so that's one of my favorites. I mean, I'm not real picky. Um, my dream is to go to like Scotland and Ireland to play golf at some oh, point. Yeah. Uh, I, this fall, past fall, I got to play at Firestone Country Club, which is in Akron, Ohio. They hold PGA Tour events there. Um, and so with a caddy, which was really nerve wracking when you had, and it was me and my caddy alone. That's what made it worse. Because wow. usually when it's like you have other people, it's like the focus isn't on you. But you become really self-aware when it's you and a caddy. I could only, because uh, I, I can only imagine. I, I've never had a caddy. I am the well, caddy. <laughs> well, we need to get Jim Palmer. He can be our caddy. I can do, I can get behind that too. I think Jim should be our caddy next time we're out. And I mean, we, we did that conduct uh, the reading session in Chicago and you had your clubs with you. 
you know, ne next time I'm going to bring my clubs. You know, it's definitely one of those things. And it's great to be able to have something. You're going to different destinations. I think that the golf course, just in its beauty, you mentioned Sawgrass. It's like, oh my gosh, that's like mm -hmm. iconic. You know, so to, to be able to, in, you know, you can find those in a, like a, even like a little nine hole course, a local course, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of, kind of what we do in music too. We kind of travel to different places and we get the local culture. So you kind of do that similar thing through golf, except I'm sure I'm way worse than you. So we definitely have to bring Jim along so that I don't look as bad as I actually am. So you are not bad. I mean, Jim is like a 15 handicapper, so we're good. <laughs> All right, David, that's going to wrap it up for us. I want to thank you again for joining us today. This is a little bit of behind the scenes. This is what we get to talk about when we're in person with each other and all over the place. And we thought it would be really great for other people to kind of see what we're like behind the pictures that they might see on a website or something. So thanks for joining me again today. Uh, everybody else, we'll see you next time.